underfloor heating systems. I'm not even sure where to start with this, so tell you what, let's start with a bit of instant gratification. Polypipe, power, valve, pump, boiler, LEDs, polypipe, four LEDs to indicate zones. Whip the covers off. I'm going to be reverse engineering these, engineering these circuit boards. I'm going to take them out and I'm going to basically reverse engineer and draw the schematic just to see how this all works. But to start off, we have to understand what it does in the first place. So, underfloor heating is fairly popular in the UK. It, sometimes you have radiators upstairs, sometimes it's if you've got a solid floor downstairs, you'll have the underfloor heating. And the underfloor heating is basically, it's a layer of insulation, then a support for pipes. And the pipes are zigzagged under the floor and they come to a manifold and then the whole lot is screeded across and then carpet and everything put on. You end up with a, a just the whole floor heats and it's quite nice. I have to say it is pleasant walking those floors. But um, they're often integrated in to what's called an S-plan system. So here's the boiler in the house. Let's zoom down this a little bit, because once I've explained this, the other stuff in these modules will become more obvious. So we have the boiler and its pump. And uh, we have a common control line going to all these valves. And each of these valves uh, has a switch in it so that when the valve is open, it hits the switch and that provides control. It says to the boiler that something's calling for water. So say, for instance, the hot water tank uh, was getting cool. It, uh, the thermostat switches the valve on. The valve runs to the open position, hits the switch, uh, sends a signal back to the boiler. The pump runs, and because that valve is open, the water will actually pass through the hot water heater. If other zones also call for water at the same time, it will just be shared. It will find its way through them all. Um, the difference with the... Underfloor heating is, they don't just run the water straight through the underfloor heating hose. It actually continually gets circulated by its own pump and there's a mixer to regulate the temperature. So it only pulls in hot water as needed. And the boiler, it's not too bothered about that because it's still passing water through the system. But the boiler, uh, once it reaches its set temperature, it will just, you know, it will still be pumping water, but it will just go into sort of standby until it's uh, more heat called for. So um, the point of these units is that this controls everything for the underfloor heating. It controls the pump, it controls the valve, um, and the uh, wiring then facilitates sending that signal back to the boiler. Okay. I have to say, I got a bit of a baptism of fire with these. I wasn't really that interested in underfloor central heating until an elderly friend said, could you come and take a look at our heating because it stopped working? And I thought, oh, that'll be easy. It'll just be a valve and a switch or something like that. And uh, I went out and her husband, who was quite elderly, had been doing a DIY project and he was remodeling a walk-in cupboard. And... The cupboard had some old heating stuff in the wall that was part of the old heating system, he presumed. And it turned out, no, it wasn't. It was actually part of their new heating system. So uh, it had the manifold, it had the pump, it had the valves, and he just, without turning the power off or anything, said, well, that's not needed anymore. So he chopped all the wire off the pump and off the valves, and then he took the cover off this and chopped all the wires off this. And then he took this off the wall and he threw it in the bin. And that's the point their heating stopped working. He didn't just do that. All the cables still live. I, I presume it must have tripped a breaker. He poked them through the plasterboard and through the floorboard so there was nothing there. And that included breaking this control line so that none of the heating in that area of the house worked anymore. So I got out there and it was just... It was instant regret. I regret actually seeing I'd take a look at the heating for them. I did not realise what he'd done. So this is a uh, just single-sided, which is nice. They've reinforced the tracks for the current carrying capacity. It's worth mentioning that um, they've got what looks like graphite ink on these, which is odd. And that's because these units can actually be plugged end to end. You've got the master unit. If you've just got a single zone, say you had one room with just one uh, section of heating in it, that you just need this. But if you wanted, if you had, say, several rooms or several sections of a room, each with its own thermostat, you could then add the slave unit onto the master. And then instead of just using a thermostat on the master, you'd have like 
an option of up to four thermostats and four sets of uh, valves. And the valves it controls are these. These are thermoelectric actuators. See this little red thing in here? Uh, it's normally pushing down with quite significant force onto the valve. When you actually screw this onto the valve uh, or the manifold, it presses down and it turns the water off by pushing the, the valve down. When this is provided with power from the slave unit, you just basically hook it in, hook it in here. Uh, it heats up internally. Uh, they say you've not to open these because it's a very powerful spring or something and it's quite dangerous. That It's got lots of warnings about that. So uh, in another video, I'll take one of these to bits, I think. But uh, once it's been uh, running for a while, it starts off fairly high current. It's obviously self-regulating PTC sort of thermistor thing. Uh, that little red plunger will gradually retract. And you can see how far it retracts. And this little flag here also retracts up inside to show that the valve is open. But, um, <clears throat> these plug together and... Uh, it's clear that, you know, they just basically go like that. And I wonder how good a connection that makes because uh, the graphite... Well, hold on, let's get the meter and check that. I'm surprised they didn't just have tinned contacts. I wonder why they've chosen the graphite coating. Is it to kind of semi-lubricate it or something like that? So let's just null out the leads. Let's see what the leads are measuring. Uh, about, say, 0.6 ohms. Let's get a connection onto one of these pads and then touch it onto the surface. Oh, I get a good connection here. Not getting a good connection here. Maybe that pad isn't actually connected to that. Oh, there it goes. See, that's quite a high resistance, isn't it? That's a good few ohms with that uh, graphite. It's not as conductive, that sort of conductive paint. Maybe as the thing bites in, it makes a better connection. So I wonder why they've used the graphite. Is it to make it easier to slide across or just to sort of mate it on better, I don't really know. It's not a huge amount of current though. All it's doing, it's uh, powering the thermostats, uh, just two wire thermostats, 240 volts, um, and it's also these things, the these valves are pretty much nothing, you know, they, they uh, start with a Fairly high inertia current of about, say, the equivalent of about 20 watts or so, I think. I've not actually tested that. But then it settles down when they're hot to about 2.5 watts. But anyway, um, I'm going to take these circuit boards, I'm going to take the other circuit board out. Then I'm going to re reverse engineer them. And then we'll explore the circuitry and I'll draw out the schematic and we can see how it works. First section is reverse engineered, the main master control unit. And it's quite interesting. It's very cost optimized. You can see the circuitry isn't super complex here. In fact, all these components are purely for the LEDs. And you might notice there's one, two, three resistors. The reason for that is there are four LEDs in this unit to fill the fact that there are basically four LED positions because the same case is used for the uh, slave units and it's got the four LED positions and all they've done is they've wired these two LEDs in series so pump and boiler will both come on simultaneously because they're always active together. Other things worthy of note about this case is that it does have the DIN rail mounting facility as well as the standoff brackets for screwing straight to the wall and it's got these slots here that have ribs so that the cables um, can actually be pressed down between these slots and it will grip the cables tightly. They'll be quite thin cables because most of these cables are just going out to the little uh, control valves or the, uh, the thermostats. So let's take a look at the circuitry. Uh, things worthy of note. Uh, your main supply comes in here and there's a link that's because you've got the option for the time switch, and uh, if you use the time switch, then you take that link out and wire it across it. Um, you have the pump, live neutral and earth, which when the system is calling for uh, heat, the local pump to the system, the one that circulates the water around the, the underfloor central heating, it runs. We've got the two-port valve, and it's optional. If this was the, say for instance, you just had a multi-zone system, but there was nothing else in the house that was just going straight to the boiler, then you wouldn't need this. And that's why they've got a little link here. Um, because if you don't use a two-port valve, you leave that link in because that's the, the end switch, the end of travel switch that then actually activates the rest of the system once the valve has changed position. Things worthy of note here, there's two relays. This relay is interesting because it's got a capacitor across its windings. That 
is because it's been fed in a very odd way. It's a 230 volt relay, but it's actually being fed with half wave mains. And that's a smoothing capacitor. So they've obviously just found it, it works this way. And that's how they've done it. And it makes it very simple for controlling it from not just the local thermostat, uh, which is only used if this is used in its own, this unit. But also it means that all the other thermostats can go onto a common bus via the diodes and they can control this. I'll show you that in the schematic. <laughs> So we get the thermostat position here if it's a standalone unit. Then we get this relay, which uh, is activated once uh, everything else, say for instance, once the heating's called, two port valve moves position, turns on the pump, it'll also turn on that relay, which sends a signal back to the boiler. It's got a set of volt-free contacts here, which are just across their own pair of contacts with no voltage on them, just a closed contact. <clears throat> That could be used for low voltage systems or if we are, the boiler is in a different circuit and it would mean you'd have two separate feeds come into this but you don't want to combine the two. Uh, it also has the standard live contact which uh, this terminal block here has resin in one of the positions. I thought they'd have just combed the two positions and said well if put it in one of them but I suppose it's to keep it as simple as possible. But uh, if you connect it in that, then the other contact in this really bridges it to live. I'll show you the schematic for this. So I've colour coded a bit to make it as easy as possible here. So there's that uh, relay. Now, the uh, yeah, let's uh, just, we'll start at this end. There's the relay that uh, is being run via diodes, and that's why it's got a capacitor across it to smooth that. So it can be controlled either from the local thermostat going via that diode to live, um, and then that relay comes in, or it can be controlled by the, the external, the slave units, that if any of the slave units comes on, it sends it along the control signal. It basically pulls the control signal via its own diode uh, to the live, and it controls that relay as well. When that relay comes on, it closes this contact. Actually, it's both the contacts in parallel. And that provides power down to the valve if it's fitted. And the valve uh, also has the switch at the end of travel. So once the valve has gone to the fully open position, the switch closes and it provides power to the pump, uh, which starts running locally, but it also provides power to this relay, which then operates the boiler call contact. So the volt-free contact with just the bare uh, contact and the live control, which just basically goes from live via the contact. So it puts 240 volts back to the boiler. I've shown the... Uh, LED indicators as uh, in purple to differentiate from the others. So in the case of uh, the first one to activate them, well, the first one that's lit all the time is the green LED. That's, uh, this green LED here is just basically run via resistor from the mains completely. That would be useful for telling if the fuse had blown or the power was off to the unit. It's worth mentioning here that the uh, time switch just kills power to this whole unit. It's Oddly, it's mounted before the switch. I thought they might have mounted it after the, should I say, before the fuse, but it's mounted before the fuse. That might have just been because of the layout on the circuit board. It was just easier to do it that way. So that's the green LED that operates at very low intensity. But these uh, channels, it's quite nice. They've got a conical light guide in them with a little plastic pin down the middle. And it does, even at low intensity, it transfers light quite well. I could just shine. Well, this is not going to be low intensity. This is going to be quite high intensity, but I shall shine a torch up and you can see that uh, it just guides the light up to the top of these units uh, to make them glow. And it's not bright, but it's enough to actually tell something is happening. Uh, the valve has its own LED for valve. And the pump and boiler, they've got the two LEDs in the series because, well, ultimately it's activating the pump and it's activating the boiler call relay. So they've obviously just decided, well, we've got four positions we have to fill, so we'll just common these two LEDs together. Uh, next thing to look at is the slave unit. Anything else worth mentioning on this? Um, we've got the three connections going out to the slave. We've got live, neutral, and we've got the control um, signal. Now, which is which here? Uh, this one is live. So the middle one's live. The bottom one's neutral. And the top one's control. That's the common for all the sort of slaves to actually control this. I think I've covered everything here. Okay, yes, I have. Let's bring in the, the next exhibit, which is the slave unit. 
the sleeve unit, you can get these four-way or six-way or even just one-way. And they just bridge in. You can see there's the uh, live there, there's the neutral there, there's the, uh, the uh, common. And it's very, very simple. You've got the terminals. It's basically just repeated multiple times. You've got the terminal uh, for the thermostat. And then it controls the, it's got two sets for multiple uh, zone valves. They show up to four zone valves. I'm not really sure why they'd use so many valves, unless it's just multiple sections on a manifold that they just want to control together off one thermostat. But they show that, uh, I think they limit it to two per terminal set, just purely because of the ease of terminating the cables and not having too many stuffed into the one connector. But they, these are just paralleled across. You can see there's a parallel bridge and there's the parallel bridge. Um, and once again, the LED, uh, just as a 100K resistor, so when the thermostat comes on, the LED lights, but it also has this diode here. Uh, which then links to this common and all these diodes just bridge to this common and then it continues out the other side so you can actually stack these units end to end to end just to actually uh, connect as many circuits as you want so it's suitable for quite large heating systems here is the schematic for the slave and I'll just show one way so we get the live going through the thermostat um, <clears throat> And when it closes, then effectively the control line with the, the diodes, uh, the, it's connected to live via the diode. But that also brings in the valve actuator units that are connected down to neutral. And it also lights the LED, uh, which is the resistor diode and the LED itself. So the LED glows to show that the thermostat has come in and it's calling for heating. Um, it's very simple. And then that's multiplied one times, four times, six times, or stack them together and make it eight times as many as you want up to up to a limit. So all in all, it's very, very simple. It's a, it simplifies the wiring greatly. It's basically, it's like that uh, Honeywell wiring marshalling box, whereby there's no real doubt about what connects where. And these, these units are actually fairly expensive. Uh, but you can get them cheap on eBay when people, it's very clear that people buy these for their own home heating projects and then realised they bit off more than they could chew or the floor wasn't suitable. So they got the kit and then they went with ordinary radiators and they, they put them on. So um, at the time when I was looking for these, I went, I decided to get a couple of units and actually explore them when I was uh, fixing that for my my friends. Uh and uh, it just made sense to buy some sets to get used to how it all went together and worked. As I got their heating working again. It was interesting. Uh, but that's an interesting cheat they've got there. That little running the this relay via those diodes on AC, but just effectively it's powered half wave and then it's got that uh, capacitor. I don't know the value capacitor is. I'd have to actually have to remove it, but I'm going to guess it's not going to be a super high value. It might be 100 nanofarad or something. All it has to do is kind of avoid this buzzing and just hold it and give it a bit of remnants. But... um. <clears throat> Easy to connect to, just the mains voltage thermostats and then the, the going out to these uh, port valve actuators or whatever you've got. In this case, uh, ultimately, the you've only got five connections for your two port valve and you've only got the live neutral for the pump. It's all very straightforward. Uh, to someone, particularly a heating engineer who knew what the function of the, like, the boiler control signals was, it would be very easy. And it would be quite fast. It would definitely simplify the wiring of the system. But there we go. The polypipe underfloor central heating system. I'll just tame that image down a wee tad, I think. Maybe I won't tame the image down a wee tad. No, I've just flared the image out dramatically. Okay. But uh, there it is. Standard cases. Uh, an a slottable system. You can just slot them together. Um, and stack them and mount them in din rail or just screw them to the wall. It's quite smart. And it certainly does the job. And uh, fixing my friend's heating was an educational experience. I ended up knowing a lot more about underfloor heating than I'll probably ever need. But there we go. Interesting stuff.